My name is Trey Harrell. Um, I have the wonderful task of talking with you about the uh, foundational Supreme Court cases um, dealing with gun rights and the Second Amendment in the United States. Um, first about me, I'm a former prosecutor um, who now works at the Pepper Law Firm. I do uh, majority uh, personal injury work, a lot of government um, tort claim stuff, sprinkling a little bit of estates work and a little bit of criminal work, you know. If it pays, I'll do it, right? Um, so I say all that because you need to refer cases to me. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, anyway, um, what we're gonna talk about today, they have the only out, normally when we talk and do classes like this, oh, there we go, okay. Um, okay. Um, when we do classes like this, I get a much broader outline. But the only thing that I was given, and the only thing that I was told I have to talk to you about, can everybody see these? Are these, is it too, everybody can see it fine? All right, are these four cases. Th two, three Supreme Court cases, one uh, DC Court of Appeals case that actually is a feeder case to one of them. So it's, it's a very, um, it, it's a lot, it, it's very, it's gonna be a very interesting hour and a half to try to get done and not put y'all to sleep. So let's, uh, Let's try to do this and, and get through it. Um, but before we get into this, I know y'all been talking about the Second Amendment all day, but let's do a, a quick review of the Second Amendment. It is a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Um, when, when, when you look at the Second Amendment and, and the way we're gonna look at these cases, is we're gonna look at it from two theories, two standpoints. Um, first standpoint, we're gonna look at it as, as you can see in life, we have a right and a left. Um, gun control versus guns rights. That's the big debate and that's what's gonna be handed throughout all this. So let's, let's break down and go through um, the two sides really quickly. First, we have the right. We have um, the gun rights folks that like to look at, they break down the Second Amendment when they do it, and they like to look at it at the, as the second part of the Second Amendment. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. What this is considered is the individual right or the right of the people view. Uh, meanwhile, we have the gun control folks um, who like to look at the second, or like to look at the first part of the uh, Second Amendment, which is a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. And that's considered the collective right. And when we talk, when we get into talk about the case, especially when we talk about the first case we're gonna talk about, the Miller case, we're gonna really understand what this collective right is. Did y'all talk about collective and individual right earlier on? Okay, good, so this is, this is new. I'm not, I'm not saying the same thing you've already learned, good. Um, well, that's what we're gonna, um, we're gonna look at it from those two scenarios. Um, the first, um, sorry, let me, go, let me back up. As we go to try to decide these cases, um, and, and the Supreme Court had decided the case, they always had to look back at the founders and see what the founders um, would have said and would have done. Um, I'll tell you, when, when doing this, if you type in gun control or guns rights into Google, a lot of crazy stuff comes up. So I figured I'd share a couple of them with you. Um, so now on with the CLE. All right, first thing I gotta talk about are the 19th century cases. Um, mainly with the 19th century cases, what we saw going on, there isn't a big seminal or big outline case from that. It was a lot of district court cases that were used by criminal defense attorneys who would wrap up into their um, into their defense, trying to exonerate their client, a Second Amendment issue, saying he, he was allowed to have the gun. You know, don't put him to jail. Don't send him to jail, let him go. That, that's how they would wrap it up. Um, but a lot of these cases, it, it, nothing really came of it. It wasn't really until 1939 when we got the United States v. Miller. Um, and the issue in Miller, and, and the way I'm gonna talk about the cases is I'm, we're gonna talk about, because it's going to be a longer um, 
process in talking about them, and I can't just stand up here and, and tell you about a case because it'd be really boring. Um, we're going to talk about the history around the cases because maybe that makes it a little more interesting. Um, but for the brief part of it, and, and brief is in back when we were in law school and we had to brief cases, um, the issue. The issue in the United States v. Miller was does the Second Amendment protect an individual's rights to keep and bear arms? All right. Before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about, um, about uh, Miller and Jack Miller and Frank Lawton. They were arrested in Oklahoma. Um, sorry, they were arrested in crossing the Oklahoma border into Arkansas. Um, when, you did, when I did a lot of research on this, I found a lot of interesting stuff about this case, and it kind of broke down. Um, what you had was, and that's Jack Miller. Jack Miller was basically a washed up bank robber. Um, he was born about 1900 and he was about a 240 pound thug. By 1921, he was already in trouble with the law and his troubles worsened in 1924 when he killed a young court reporter um, while he was working as a bouncer at the Oak Cliff Resort. Now, as the story goes, um, he didn't try to kill him. Uh, the young court reporter was uh, drunk and messing with his, his date. And so Miller punched him in the face and broke his jaw. And a few weeks later, he succumbed to an infection. Um, after that, he posted his bond and ran. Um, he then joined up with the O'Malley gang, um, who was a pretty uh, romanticized gang back in the 1920s. 1930s, pure depression era, bank robbers, Bonnie and Clyde stuff like you'd see on TV. Um, and what eventually happened was they robbed a lot of banks and they got arrested. Um, when they got arrested, uh, Jack Miller decided he was going to flip on his uh, guys, on his gang members, fellow gang members. And in flipping on them, I promise all this has to do with, with the case, I, I promise. Um, in flipping on them, uh, he was uh, granted immunity and released. However, um, you know, he was a thug who'd been in, in and out of prison. He didn't have any skills. He didn't know how to get a job, so he fell back into a life of crime. And he was teaming up with Frank Lawton and robbing banks again and robbing convenience or gas stations again. Um, in, one, in one such incident, they, incident, they robbed a uh, convenience store that had slot machines in it um, just before uh, in, in the late 30s. And as they were fleeing that, they, they robbed the bank in Oklahoma, the convenience store in Oklahoma, and were fleeing to Arkansas to try to get away. Um, as they crossed the state line, they were picked up um, and found with a sawed off double barrel shotgun. Um, as they, um, once they were picked up with the double barrel shotgun, they were then placed in um, custody, and the prosecutor, the young aspiring prosecutor, decided we were going to push with the National Firearms Act, which y'all talked about earlier. Correct? Okay. Um, we were going to talk. We were going to push on the National Firearms Act, and I'm going to go get a conviction under this big federal act so I can make a name for myself, and I can get elected governor. Um, they went forward with that, and they were able to get an indictment in the Arkansas court. Um, they indicted uh, Jack Miller and Frank Lawton. Um, however, um, they then took the case. Um, once they were indicted, um, their attorney um, made the argument, like we were talking about with the 19th century cases, that stated that's a violation of his Second Amendment right. Therefore, um, it, it doesn't stand. Judge Reagan, not Ronald Reagan, may he rest in peace, but uh, different Reagan, um, agreed with that argument and said the court is of the opinion that this section is invalid and it violates the Second Amendment. He gave no other explanation for, for why he did that and he let them go free. However, um, the U.S. Attorney uh, on January 30th, 1939, appealed this decision um, saying that, that Reagan made a uh, material error. Um, what's interesting about that is when, this, when it got to the Supreme Court, 
um, Jack Miller um, was nowhere to be found. He had fled because since he ratted on his fellow gang members, he knew that he was a marked man, um, which he obviously did. He obviously met his demise just before the decision came out, um, so his inclinations were right. However, in reviewing it, um, the Supreme Court took the opinion and held that um, Sorry, let me, let me go back. The holding of the case was uh, the Supreme Court overturned the decision of the district court, and the Supreme Court did not directly define the Second Amendment, but did not agree with the government's claims that it had the power to restrict the right to bear arms in any way it felt necessary. Um, this, this argument that the state made with no other attorney on the other side um, basically stated that the National Firearms Act only limited to a small individual group of weapons, and therefore it was allowed. It, didn't, it wasn't a broad restriction. And it narrowly constructed it as to giving the federal government the ability to uh, pass laws or local municipalities to pass laws to restrict individuals. Now, a fun fact about this is Judge Reagan was actually a, a very big proponent of gun control law, and he knew that uh, Miller would not be able to make it to court in the Supreme Court, and he would ultimately get the ruling that he wanted on that level, thus um, let it go on through. Um, most scholars have, have said that the Miller decision is actually a very murky decision, and the gun control folks argued that it established that collective right theory that we talked about um, a little bit earlier. Um, in fact, Justice John Paul Stevens said in his book, The Sixth Amendment, which which is a great read, uh, by the way, and um, if you get a chance, pick it up, um, that uh, when he joined the court in 1975, that holding was generally understood as limiting the scope of the Second Amendment to uses of arms that were related only to military activities. Um, so, after the Miller case, what we then had was uh, a very, very long law. We went from, well, let me back up. Supreme Court has only mentioned the Miller decision in seven subsequent cases, two of which we're about to talk about, D.C. Heller and McDonald. Um, and they didn't mention any Second Amendment cases until 1961, anything dealing with the Second Amendment until 1961. Um, so it's, it's a very interesting thing and there are a lot of legal scholars that have talked about this and and tried to figure out why no cases why didn't we have a lot of cases why isn't this an, an issue that was purely defined and um, in in going through that what, what you tend to found, find is that the Supreme Court spent the 20th century most of the 20th century um, interpreting the first fourth fifth sixth and eighth amendments they didn't pay a lot of attention to the Second Amendment, um, which there's, there's arguments on both sides as to why that occurred. One of the theories behind that is that the traditional civil rights liberties groups like the ACLU approached it from a collective rights theory, not an individual rights theory. And so most folks that push for the civil liberties and your, and your rights to your constitutional rights weren't pushing those cases. Additionally, the NRA and those other gun rights groups um, focus their efforts on lobbying because they believe that litigation was just too risky. And in researching this and reading this, I've read, I, I came across a lot of great articles about um, Heller and um, Chicago, um, Chicago v. McDonald, a lot of great articles about it. Um, one in particular that stood out was they interviewed uh, a guy, by, a gentleman by the name of Alan Garrar. He was a 37-year-old um, attorney uh, who argued this case at the time, was 37 years old, when he argued in front of the Supreme Court. I'm 33, you know, that's kind of, it's a lot to live up to, right? No. Um, anyway, um, and what he said was that virtually all the decisions that address the Second Amendment were always styled United States versus somebody. And I'm quoting, somebody was a crack dealer, a bank robber, or some low life." who made a spurious Second Amendment claim as part of a package desperate plea to try to get exonerated. Um, and faced with those cases, um, 
almost every federal appeals court um, had to endorse the collective rights view because that's just the way it, it boiled down. And so the NRA and folks didn't want to go forward with, with this kind of litigation because they didn't want to risk it. So that was basically the way it was until 2001. And then in 2001, a, a federal case by the name of Emerson v. U.S. It wasn't on our syllabus, but I, I, I figure it's pretty important to note because that's how we got to where we are with these, these other foundational cases. Um, it stated, oh, it stated um, what happened was for, for Emerson v. U.S. was a Texas man was indicted by a federal grand jury for possessing a pistol while under a restraining order after threatening his wife, um, his estranged wife. The trial judge dismissed it on Second Amendment grounds. However, uh, the Fifth Circuit reinstated the indictment but held that the Second Amendment does protect an individual right to bear arms. Um, when this occurred, Alan Guerrero, the guy I mentioned earlier, was recruited by Robert Levy and some other individuals at the Cato Institute to put together litigation going forward and, and, and figure out how to define this and go for it. Because what, what the order from Emerson v. U.S. did, and, and as Mr. Guerrero said in his Wall Street Journal interview that I read, um, for the first time ever, we have a clear and concise, intelligent examination of the Second Amendment with a true analysis of the document and the conclusion was that it secured an individual right. What it also meant was we had a split in authorities. We had different appeals courts saying different things. So it was coming up. The, the Supremes were going to get it. Um, and what the Cato guys and the other Second Amendment folks feared was we were going to have another one of those uh, USV cases, and it was, or it was going to be some pro se, quoting, some pro se lunatic criminal or some defense attorney just trying to exonerate his client rather than um, vindicating the Constitution. Thus, enter D.C. v. Heller. Um, D.C. v. Heller was the brainchild of those three lawyers. And what those three lawyers, uh, Levy, Guerrero, and another gentleman decided to do was they took the approach that Thurgood Marshall took um, with school segregation and decided we're going to recruit plaintiffs. And to quote what they said was they're going to do careful, strategic litigation on the issue. Um, they had... They had to um, figure out what they were going to do to go forward. And so what they did was they picked a, a venue, a court that hadn't ruled on it, had no history of ruling on it, which happened to be the U.S. District of Appeals Court in, uh, in the District of Columbia. And um, it also worked out that the nation's capital had the most restrictive gun law in the country. It was a total ban on handguns and a requirement that shotguns and rifles be kept disassembled or locked within the home. And in their, so in their attempt to do this strategic litigation, um, they consciously uh, went out and found plaintiffs across the demographic spectrum. Levy, in fact, in talking about this, told the New York Times that he, along with the lawyers, with the other lawyers, modeled their strategy after Theodore Marshall um, and went forward to find a then novel approach of assembling an attractive panel of plaintiffs to challenge the specific, specific laws. Um, in doing the research, I found out about the, the plaintiffs, and I figured I'd, I'd share it with you. Um, their outline of plaintiffs were Dick Heller, who's the gentleman we have right here, and he was a special police officer for the District of, Co District of Columbia Appeals Court. Um, what he did uh, was guard judges, and he was able to have his gun at work all the time. However, when he went home, it was illegal for him to take his gun out of his car into his home. He didn't like that. He wanted to be able to have his gun. The other person we had uh, was a guy by the name of Tom Palmer, who was a Cato scholar and was a gay man who had fended off a hate crime by using a firearm that he happened to have on him in the state of California. Um, he said that he was alive today and at least avoided serious injury because he had the gun when he needed it. Another person, another plaintiff, was Gillian St. Lawrence. She had a lawfully registered shotgun and always kept it unloaded, but realized that, that wasn't, it wasn't uh, 
going to be helpful in the attempt of somebody breaking into her small one-bedroom studio apartment in Georgetown, as you can remember those small studio one-bedroom apartments in Georgetown. Um, the other individual we had was a lady by the name of Shelley Parker. We're going to talk about Shelley Parker because it's the same Shelley Parker that was DCV Parker. Um, but she was an African-American lady who moved to a part of Capitol Hill that was approving, but not fast enough. She would, she would call the police. You okay? Okay. She would call the police and get the neighbors involved to try to get the drug dealers off the street. The drug dealers figured out fairly quickly what the source of their problem was and started harassing her, subjecting her to all kinds of threats um, and so on. So, um, knowing the plaintiffs, let's move on to the actual case. The issue in this case, in pure uh, law school fashion, the issue was, uh, do gun regulations passed by the District of Columbia violate an individual's Second Amendment rights? The facts behind this case were a group of private gun owners felt their rights were violated. The case was first heard at the federal court level in Washington, D.C., the judge ruled, for the, uh, ruled against the plaintiffs, excuse me, and interpreted that the Second Amendment only applied to militias, went with that collective uh, theory approach. Um, the plaintiffs then appealed their decision, which was heard at the U.S. District Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals uh, overturned the trial court's decision and concluded that the Second Amendment does protect individuals. Um, and thus, on November the 20th, 2007, the Supreme Court took the case, and on June 26, 2008, the Supreme Court confirmed the ruling, rulings of the uh, appeals court. Uh, by a vote of five to four, the court decided that the Second Amendment protects a civilian's right to keep a handgun in his home for the purposes of self-defense. Now, even though that was a 5-4 decision, all nine of the justices um, opined, or the, the five in the majority and the four in their dissenting opinions, all opined and all agreed that the Second Amendment establishes an individual right to have a gun. Um, because of that establishment, it basically changed the way we looked at the Second Amendment post-Miller. Um, fun fact about this case, though, um, in the interview that uh, the young attorney gave with the Wall Street Journal, he, was te he would tell a story about how Justice Kennedy was the swing vote. Um, and he was getting a lot of grief. A lot of people were talking to him about um, what are you doing to prepare for Kennedy? What are you doing to prepare Ke for Kennedy? Um, and his, his quote, I think, was very, was very eloquent to the way he talked about it, was if you look at Justice Kennedy's voting pattern, the cases where he tends to disappoint the so-called conservative bloc, and in almost all of those cases, the justice sides with a claim of an individual right being held by a person against the government. So even the most, even a judge who, who finds normally against these conservative positions took the time and was able to find that a person has an individual right to carry a gun. Um, next, let me briefly talk about Parker because it was on the syllabus and we need to talk about it. Um, Parker is the same Shelly Parker that I talked about who was getting rocks thrown through her windows, um, car vandalized, everything because she was trying to do much better, um, trying to make it better. Um, the district court in a 2-1 decision uh, found that the Second Amendment protects an individual right to keep and bear arms and that once determined as we have done, that handguns are arms, as referred to in the Second Amendment, it is not open to the district to ban them. Um, so in essence, what the Supreme Court said was the District of Columbia is a, um, is a district and is a, a federal territory, and therefore you can't restrict individuals from having a gun. Um, Meanwhile, the one dissenting judge uh, found that since it refers to the security of a free state and the district is not a state, this is what I was getting at a second ago, therefore the amendment does not apply to the district. However, Parker and Heller left one unresolved question. Whether it limits the states 
as well as the federal government. Um, as we know, the Bill of Rights restrained Congress, restrained, sorry, it's the lights again, restrained only Congress under the incorporation doctrine, doctrine and the Supreme Court has held that the 14th Amendment protects most constitutional rights against state encroachment. Because the capital is a federal district, its local government is a creation of the US, United States Congress. The Heller decision gave no reason to think that incorporation does not apply. But as we found out, as, as you can probably guess, uh, further litigation was needed to settle this matter. Enter McDonald v. Chicago. Um, an interesting fun fact about this is McDonald v. Chicago was, quote, ready to go when the Supreme Court decided Heller. Um, while Guerrero was preparing to argue Heller in front of the Supreme Court, um, Robert Levy and the Cato Institute were already lining up their plaintiffs for McDonald v. Chicago. Um, Mr. McDonald, right down there, was uh, one of those plaintiffs. Um, interesting fact about Mr. McDonald is he was one of 12 children born to Louisiana sharecroppers. He left his farm at 17 to go find work in the big city. And after struggling for many years in low paying seasonal jobs, he finally got hired by the University of Chicago um, and bought his house in the Morgan Park area of Chicago. And what occurred was he wanted, he wanted a handgun because when he first bought his house, in um, 1971, it was a clean neighborhood. It was a great neighborhood. Um, however, um, in the time leading up to this, he, um, he had his house broken into uh, five times, three to the house, two to the garage. Um, and so he went forward to push this out. And what he said is um, that he, he was an avid hunter and fisherman and owned a rifle and a shotgun, but due to the ban, it was not functional for him to be able to defend himself if someone broke into his house. Um, the additional plaintiffs in this were a guy by the name of Adam Olaf, who, was a, who grew up in a liberal household, was a constitutional nut, and followed um, the Heller case very strictly, so much so that he uh, finagled himself a ticket to the oral arguments of Heller. Um, the other two was Colleen and David Larson, who were a mixed-race middle-aged couple that lived on the far northwest side of Chicago. Um, David was a 43-year-old software engineer who had long opposed Chicago's handgun ban, while his wife, Colleen, was a 51-year-old hypnotherapist who became personally interested in the issue after her house was broken into when she was home sick one day with the flu. Um, the uh, case itself, getting on to the, the issue with the case and the, the brief of the case, uh, does the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms create an individual right of citizens to own firearms, and is that right enforceable against the state through incorporation of the Second Amendment through the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment? All right. So the facts of this case. Uh, pretty basic. Um, same, similar uh, pattern as we had with... Um, DCV Heller, he wanted a gun, he couldn't get a gun. Um, the Ch Chicago ban was put in place in 1982 and the ban allowed you to register a handgun and if you registered, uh, if you attempted to register the handgun, the process was so complex that basically it worked as nobody was able to register a handgun since 1982. Um, The case went up and went through, and um, the court held that an individual right to keep and bear arms is incorporated and is applicable to the states through the 14th Amendment. Um, it was a five to four vote, as you can see. The same justices came down the same way as they did in the other case. Um, it was a pretty uneventful um, hearing and what went down and going forward to it because they already knew which way the judges were going to side because they already did. Um, uh, the, the prevailing argument for this case was that the first eight amendments um, already applied to the states and the second amendment should be treated no differently. 
the rights articulated in the Bill of Rights should be assumed as fundamental. Justice Alito, in his opinion, wrote, it is clear that the framers and ratifiers of the 14th Amendment counted the right to keep and bear arms among those fundamental rights necessary to our system of ordered liberty. Unless we turn back the clock or adopt a special incorporation test applicable only to the Second Amendment, gun rights must be recognized everywhere. This, and so this decision gave the federal judges the power to strike down local and uh, state weapons laws. Special thanks to Westlaw, Google, Wikipedia, Wall Street Journal, Chicago Media, and Judge Scalia. Um, you know, I, I know this is probably going to make you mad, but that's basically all I got. We went over the cases. We can, anybody got any questions about any of the cases? Anything? Because we've got to talk for, we got to talk for another eight minutes. So, oh, there we go. Yes. I'm, I'm not familiar with the laws. In, what are the laws in New Jersey? Uh, well, the only way I know is I used to have a client who uh, was flying and was flying with approval mm -hmm. on the gun case on the airline with the gun properly locked and secured in the gun case and boarded a plane in the state that uh, shall remain nameless uh, where it was perfectly legal. The airline shipped the gun to New Jersey when he got off the plane in New Jersey. Okay. So why is that restricted? I don't know. What kind of gun? You know what kind of gun it was? It was a handgun. You know, I don't know. It, And in fact, Scalia, in his opinion in Heller, said, you're exactly right, said that um, by no means construe this as allowing to have gun in so-called sensitive places, schools, churches. So it was, it was the, I should have made that more clear. Thank you for, 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 for stepping up there. Um, that's, that's that issue. Anything else? Anybody? Any, anything? Want to talk about Gamecock signing day? Anything? <laughs> It was a good day yesterday. I don't think he said, I don't think Scalia said that it doesn't uh, confer right to have sensitive places. Didn't he say that um, it wouldn't restrict the. It wouldn't restrict them from, the government, from, from, making, from making rules reasonable. or people to putting rules forward to doing that. Yeah, for sensitive places. Very good. Yeah. Scalia would have said that it, it does, would not have said that it does restrict, you know, obviously. Um, uh, but um, that's that. I, I really, when I found this thing, I wanted to have this great spiel for you. I was going to say something really prolific and profound, but I, I don't. So right versus left, let's not ruin the Bill of Rights. That sound good? Um, that's it. Let's pass out certificates.